Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk here. Uh, I am going to give you a quick introduction to query debugging and optimization within Postgres. Uh, so again, my name is Justin Wood. I'm a staff engineer over at a company called Firework. And uh, before we get started, uh, can I get a quick show of hands to, to see who uses Postgres in production today? Perfect. Yeah, I figured most people. Uh, does anybody here do uh, query performance tuning for their applications today? Wonderful. I'm hoping that I can teach some of you a couple things, but this is meant to be an introductory talk, but everybody else hopefully will learn something as well. Uh, so to get started here, we're going to do a little bit of terminology. Uh, so Postgres has this thing called a heap. Uh, it's not the same thing as like a memory allocation heap. Uh, despite the name, it is the main storage area used in Postgres. Uh, so all of your table data here, all of your rows within your tables are going to be stored in the heap. Uh, they also have this thing called a page. Uh, sometimes known as a block, the two can be used interchangeably, and a page is just the smallest unit of storage that can be or that is used within Postgres. So, uh, in in your when you're storing tables or when you're storing rows within your tables, you are going to have multiple rows inside a single page, and then your uh, heap is or sorry your you're, you're going to use multiple pages to make up your entire uh, table. Uh, so we're going to create a small application here. Uh, we're going to have three simple tables. We're going to have a user's table that has a first and a last name, a business's table that has a legal name, as well as a business's user's table, which is just going to join the, the two tables together. Uh, nothing fancy here at all. Uh, within our system, we are going to have three queries running. The first is just going to be a select from users for a given ID. Uh, the second is going to get all the businesses associated with a certain user. And lastly, we're going to get all users associated with a given business. Pretty simple, not doing anything fancy. Uh, I should note that the second and third queries here are an approximation of what Ecto will give you when doing a preload. Uh, it's not exact, but it's close enough for our purposes. Uh, so we get our application ready. We do some performance testing on our own, probably locally, and we figure things are good enough to go. Uh, after onboarding some users, after onboarding uh, some businesses, we find that our application is slowing down. Uh, maybe we have some monitoring saying uh, what parts of our application are slowing down. Maybe we don't, uh, but we want to be proactive in our performance. Uh, so can anybody maybe make a suggestion on what we can do to uh, keep performance in mind before it actually becomes a problem? That's, that's pretty good, yeah. Um, before we get to explain, though, uh, let's take a quick look at an extension called PG Stat Statements. So this is my go-to extension when trying to uh, debug performance issues within Postgres. Uh, to, to quote the documentation there, the PG stat statements module provides a means of tracking, planning, and execution uh, statistics of all uh, SQL statements executed by the server. So PG stat statements is actually going to do the hard work for us. It's going to track down which, uh, uh, which queries are actually poorly performing and let us know before they actually become a serious problem. Uh, has anybody actually used PG stat statements in the past? Yeah, a couple people? Right on. Um, so, I mean, that, that sounds all well and good, but what exactly does that mean for us? So, uh, you need to sort of use a create extension command, just as you would any extension within Postgres. Uh, and from there, we can start using it. It's going to start collecting uh, query information, performance characteristics at runtime, et cetera. And I have a query here that I like to run that tries to uh, find these, these issues before, again, they become an actual problem. So this query is going to return uh, the parameterized version of the query. So what that means is if we look at our first query again, the select from users where ID equals whatever, uh, it's going to actually take that variable that we, that we put into our, our query, and it's going to, uh, every single uh, run of that query is going to look the same when uh, parameterized. So if we run where ID equals 10, where ID equals 11,000, those are all going to turn to the same parameterized query for us. 
Uh, from there, the second row is going to be the execution time, the total execution time across all runs of our query. The third row, or the third column there, is going to be the number of times that query has been called in our system. The fourth is going to be the mean execution time of that query. And lastly, we are going to get the total execution time as a percent compared to all other uh, queries running in our system. Then we're going to uh, order by the total execution time descending, so our, uh, our queries that take the most amount of time uh, are going to be at the, at the very top. So let's take a quick look at what this looks like for our three queries here. Uh, I know this is kind of hard to see just because uh, I had to fit it on one slide. But uh, these are the three queries running our system. From top to bottom, we have our select user where ID equals whatever, uh, select business for a given user, and select user for a given business. Now, does anybody want to make a quick guess at which query is performing the worst? The middle, the middle one? Yeah, exactly. Uh, before we get onto that, though, intuitively, we may want to look at the top one. Uh, because, uh, I mean, it's ordered by execution time, so clearly the top one's the worst, right? But if we look, actually take a look at our, at our main execution time, uh, the execution is only 0 0.01 milliseconds. That's pretty darn fast already. I'm not too sure that we can do a whole lot more to optimize that one. But uh, if we look at queries two and three, clearly something's going wrong with them. They're taking 830 and 650 milliseconds, respectively, to actually execute. So. Uh, I asked earlier, and uh, someone yelled out explain. So now that we have an actual query that we want to look at, uh, we can use explain in order to actually figure out what the problem is. Uh, now, explain, uh, if anybody hasn't used it before, will give us some um, it will give us some estimates on what Postgres is going to do with any given query. Uh, and when we add the analyze option, uh, it will also run the query in order to give us runtime characteristics of, of that query. So uh, again, explain will not actually run the query for us when we, if we just use explain. But when we add analyze, it will run the query and give us some additional information. Uh, I should note that there are additional options that we can pass to explain. Uh, but for today's purposes, we're just going to stick with, with analyze. So let's take a look at one of our queries. Uh, if you've never used explain before, you literally just prepend your query with the word explain, and you get some information. So in this case, again, we're going to use explain analyze. This is our select businesses where some user ID is equal to something. And Postgres is going to give us this query plan. Uh, does anybody familiar with looking at query plans? I see a handful of nods, hands, yeah? Uh, so one thing to note is that the execution time of this query down at the very bottom is a little over 1,500 milliseconds. Uh, that is much higher than our original mean time of 829. So we must have had some sort of a, a cache miss when, uh, when executing this query. Uh, but there's a lot of information here. It's hard to parse if this is your first time reading an execution plan. Uh, so let's, let's sort of break it down a little bit. So it looks like our businesses table is doing something called an index scan, and we are using the businesses P key index. This index is automatically created for us whenever we create a table in Postgres that uh, has a primary key. Uh, so as we can see here, uh, we are, again, doing an index scan. What this means is that we have some sort of an index that's separate from our, uh, from our heap, our main table data. And we are going to use that index and reach into the heap to grab the information that we need. That's much faster than trying to look through the entire, uh, the entire heap to try to find the data that we need. Uh, if we look towards the end here, uh, this part of the query was never actually executed. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. But overall, I think things look pretty, pretty good here. Uh, the second part of our query uh, on the business's users table is going to do something called a parallel sequential scan. Uh, this means that we are uh, in parallel. Uh, we are going to go through the entire heap for that table. That is, generally speaking, really poor performance with two pretty big caveats that I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but if we look towards the end of line one slash line two there, we see loops equals three. That means that there were three processes that went through this uh, th through the heap here. Uh, we had uh, two workers started plus the main process that are actually going to go through the, the table. So it's going to break it up into roughly, th uh, roughly three equal size chunks. And each process is going to uh, iterate over the entire heap uh, using, using that method. Uh, if we look towards the bottom here, we can see that we removed approximately 1.7 million rows from the, uh, from the table by using the sequential scan. But that's not entirely true. 
Uh, because we have loops equals three, we actually need to multiply that 1.7 million by three in order to get the real number. So we actually traversed over five million rows and threw all of them out uh, because none of them actually matched our query. That's really inefficient. Um, so quick, just a couple people here do performance tuning. What, what, kind of, what can we do to, to perform or make this query perform a little bit better? Add an index, yeah. So we're going to create an index. Uh, this index is going to be on the uh, business's users table. And what we're actually going to do here is create an index on the user ID as well as the business ID. Uh, you might think that maybe that's not necessary, but I'll get to that in just a minute here. Uh, we're going to go on the user's ID in order to be able to, uh, to search by the user ID. And we're going to add the column, the business ID, in order to be able to continue using that index for the next part of the query. So we run our query again after adding our index, and we can now see that we are doing two index scans, which is great. And actually, the first one there is an index-only scan. Uh, that was the reason I put in the second column for the index there. Uh, because we are searching by the user ID, we do not actually, sorry, we are searching by the user ID, which is why the first column is there in the index. And then we want to use the business ID column that is also in that index in order to make our index faster. Uh, the index only scan means that we do not actually have to reach into the heap of Postgres for our, our main table storage in order to pull out additional data. If we only put in the user ID column, we would need to reach in to grab that business ID in order to continue on with the query. Uh, so this, this looks much better. If we look at the bottom, the execution time is 0 0.036 milliseconds, which is, I mean, a little bit faster than the 829 milliseconds mean that we had before. And uh, it's orders of magnitude faster. So uh, we, we get a pretty good win by just remembering to, to put in proper indexes for our, for our queries. So now that we've created this index, uh, hopefully it's not too surprising that our other query also had a very similar issue. So we're just going to create another index for that behind the scenes here. And we let our system run for a little while, and we run our pgstat statements query again. So in this case, we went from 800 some and 600 some milliseconds down to 63 and 55 milliseconds mean, uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. If we let our application continue to run, we would continue to see that mean drop because there was, the number was quite low. But something else happened here. Uh, at some point, we've introduced another new query into our system. And again, because of the substring, it's kind of hard to, to actually see what's going on here. But uh, let's, let's take a quick look at it. So we run explain analyze again. Uh, we have a query here. Somebody introduced some business logic that we want to be able to search by first and last name for our users. I mean, that kind of sounds like something that's somewhat useful. Uh, so uh, this, this is what happens as businesses continue to grow, right? We, we get new business needs, and our code needs to adapt to it. But what we also need to keep, keep in mind is that our, our database, our optimizations, continue to perform under these new business logic. Uh, so let's, let's take a quick look at what exactly is happening here. So we have another parallel sequential scan. Uh, we are doing, again, three loops. Uh, if you can see just before that, rows equals 26. So we're returning 26 rows for John Smith's. And our rows removed are 33 million. Multiply that by three, and we are dropping almost 100 million records in order to find 26. That's pretty efficient, right? Yeah? OK. Uh, so what can we do to, to optimize this one? At an index. Uh, just because you said it, I'm sorry to do this to you, but what can you can you suggest an index? Um, index on first name, column, last name. Great. Before we get onto that, though, I want to show something that I've seen happen in the past. So what I've seen is people will create one index per column that you're searching for. Now, this will give you a performance benefit, but not the one that you're looking for. Uh, so let's take a quick look at what this does, right? So we create our two indexes. We run our query again. We say our execution is now at 60 milliseconds. We, we pat ourselves on the back, and we continue on with our day, right? No? No, OK. Um, sorry? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so we're, we're at 60 milliseconds. We're down from our 2,310 2, milliseconds without the index, uh, and we are Kind of looking OK. Uh, like I said, you do get a performance benefit, but maybe not the one that you're looking for. So let's dig a little bit deeper into what exactly is, is happening here. 
Uh, so we get these new things. We get something called a bitmap. Uh, um, hopefully, most people know what a bitmap is, considering we use Elixir here. Um, so what's going to happen here is we are going to traverse the two indexes. Uh, we are going to keep a bitmap, so something like 1001110, to, to point to either all of the rows or all of the pages, depending on the size of our, of our query, of our result set. Uh, so we're going to look at either the rows or the pages, and the bitmap is going to point to those. So we're going to get these two bitmaps, uh, and then we're going to do a bitmap and, because our query does a first name and last name. Uh, so we're going to do this query. We're going to, the bitmap and is going to take both bitmaps in as parameters, and it is going to do an and uh, on them. Uh, not, not super surprising there, I think. Uh, so what happens is we are going to get another bitmap out that, again, 100111, where one was in both slots of both bitmaps, and if there was a zero in either slot, we get the zero because we don't actually care about that information because it did not match both indexes. So towards the top of the query plan, we had this uh, bitmap heap scan. Uh, and it's important to point out here that we have the recheck condition here. Uh, what that means is uh, despite having gone through already to find all of the rows that we're looking at, we actually need to recheck that condition. So we are now pointing to the, uh, to the pages inside of our heap, which means that we are not pointing at a single row. So we need to open up every single page that we're pointing at, and we need to scan the entire page in order to find what's happening within our system. Uh, to, in order to find the, the pieces that we're looking for. So we've already gone through each index to find uh, which pages we're looking for, and now we need to look inside those pages in order to find the data that still matches our query. So this is uh, pretty, pretty inefficient. Uh, if you look at the bottom here, we went through, uh, I'm just going to round it up to 7,000 heap blocks uh, or pages. Um, so again, maybe not the most performant thing that we can do, and uh, the gentleman over there towards the middle suggested we create a uh, a single index, a compound index. Now, the benefit of a compound index is that it only needs to look at the one index. You don't need to compare multiple things. Uh, I will also want to say that if you have a compound index, you can actually use the first column of that index as uh, like searching only for that piece. So in this case, I have a last name, comma, first name index. Uh, if I create or if I had a query that searched only by last name, I can use this index. I do not need a separate last name only index. The same thing goes if this was a three, uh, three column index. I would be able to search by, let's just say we had last name, comma, first name, comma, age. I can search only by last name and first name if I wanted to. You do not need to use the entire index, uh, which means you also do not need multiple indexes for the same, for the same column. So we are going to run our query, uh, or sorry, we're going to create our index and we are going to run explain analyze again. Uh, and we can see here that we're doing an index scan now. I really want to point out here that our execution time is now 0.064 milliseconds. Now that's a lot better than the original 17 seconds that we had as a mean, and uh, still much better than the 2300 milliseconds that we were using uh, when we originally ran the query, and still much better than the 60 milliseconds we had when we had the, the double index. Uh, so it's really important that we have correct indexes for our queries because uh, this is orders of multiple, multiple orders of magnitude faster by having a proper index for our query. What that means is that we're not going to have to necessarily introduce some sort of a caching layer as soon. We're not going to have to uh, increase the size of our database as quickly because we can do m thousands to millions more queries per second than what we were doing originally. Now, I originally said that uh, there's two pretty big caveats to sequential scans, so let's talk about that for, for a little bit. So the, the two caveats for sequential scans is if you have sufficiently small amount of data in your table. Uh, I use, uh, because I'm Canadian, I use the example of having uh, all the provinces and territories in, uh, in a single table. That's only going to hold 13 records. Uh, when you have a sufficiently small amount of data in your table, it's always going to do a sequence scan. It's going to be faster to just look through the, da uh, the, the data uh, sequentially than it will be to try to look at an index and hop back and forth between where you are on disk. Sequential I.O. is not necessarily bad. Uh, and then the other 
big caveat is if your query retrieves, I, I don't know the exact number, but say 90 to 95 plus percentage of all of your rows in your table, uh, you're going to do sequential scan again. Again, this isn't necessarily bad. It's just the fastest way to do it. So if, you're, if you see something that is a sequential scan, you are going to need to keep in mind that if, if you're pulling out a lot of data or a very small amount of data, that that is just going to be what you, what you do. It just makes sense to happen that way. Um, but it is also important to try to keep, uh, keep track of, of sequential scans. So I have another little query that I like to use to, to do exactly that. So what this query is going to do for us is it's going to return the schema name, the table name, the number of times we've done a sequential scan on that table, the number of rows returned by the, uh, the total number of rows returned by a sequential scan, uh, the number of times we've done an index scan, and the average rows returned by, a, uh, by the, your sequential scans. Now, this is sort of some mixed data. I took this, uh, I used this after I had introduced the indexes. Uh, but as you can tell, we were originally returning uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of rows using sequential scans, which, again, a lot of rows usually mean something bad, but that's not necessarily the case. Maybe you have a, uh, a query that runs once a week to do some analytics, you mind your data, whatever it is. It's okay to have a sequential scan. That's not going to hurt your system, as long as you're not doing it all the time. If you have something that you're running every hour, uh, that takes 20 minutes to run, that might become an issue. But if you're doing it weekly, monthly, whatever the case, that's not going to be a problem. But we can still keep track of it here. Uh, and the PG stat statements query as well is going to, to help us with that kind of stuff. Uh, so keep in mind that just because something takes a long time to run, maybe, or, or you're pulling out a, <coughs> pardon me, or you're pulling out a lot of data in a single query, that's perfectly normal sometimes. Uh, just make sure you're not doing it on every single query. So uh, that's actually all I have for today. I uh, just want to say thank you to everyone on the Postgres channel on, uh, on IRC, a uh, bunch of really, really smart and helpful people there. Uh, same thing goes for the Postgres mailing lists. Uh, don't necessarily need to actually send emails in to, to get benefit. You can just sort of sit back like I do most of the time and, and just absorb information. And a quick shout out to my amazing wife and kids for without them, who knows where I'd be, and, and they support absolutely everything that I do. Um, so uh, again, just quickly here, I work for a company called Firework. I think like every organization here we're hiring. Uh, if anybody wants to come work with Elixir, our back end is 100% Elixir. Uh, we don't mind taking on people who don't necessarily know Elixir yet, uh, but if you want to scan the QR code there, it leads to our careers page, and you can sort of see what's open if, uh, if that interests anybody. Uh, if not, uh, come find me around the, the conference for the rest of the day. I'll be around. You can, you can ask me questions. Uh, we can talk a little bit about wh what we do at Firework. And uh, yeah. Uh, so quick, some quick places where you can find me. Uh, if you want to send me an email, uh, just feel free to send it to my public inbox. If you have any sort of questions about the talk that you might not think about now or, or, t or later today, uh, send me an email. Uh, otherwise, I'm basically uh, Anchors absolutely everywhere. Uh, so if you see me, come say hi. Uh, again, I'm going to be around the conference for the rest of the day. And uh, I think that's about it. Does anybody have any questions?